Hello, interwebs. Well, we're finally here at the end of 2021. Uh, finally. Thank God. Like, seriously, if 2020 felt like the year of hell from Star Trek Voyager with Janeway just taking a freaking beating the entire time, 2021 felt like it was the year that got completely erased from time by Red from that 70s show. And as such, because this year got erased from time, I'm just saying that all of us collectively did not age this year. So... I'm not turning 30 in 2022, I'm staying 29. I, I'm not, I'm making that official right now, saying that right up front. Ah, uh, disregarding the rules of time, I truly am honoring Janeway in the best fashion. The future is the past, the past is the future, it all gives me a headache. But since this video is going to come out on the last day of 2021, and knowing that most of you are probably, smartly, not on YouTube right now, but cozying up with your loved ones, or at the very least trying to end the year on a positive note, I figured I'd just be a little indulgent with this last video of the year and just, share some of my favorite things from the year. I mean, one of the wonderful things about being a YouTuber is that I get to share with all of you on my platform things that inspire me, that move me, that touched me this year. And I know that's a real privilege for me to be able to do, and I like doing that stuff, but I also know that there's only so much time and energy that I have. So even within all of that, there are things that I loved, enjoyed, that really uh, energized me and got me excited that I didn't really have a chance or time to talk about on this channel. So this video is going to be a little bit of a potpourri of just me kind of just sharing with you things that got me really excited that I haven't had a lot of chance to talk about elsewhere. Or if I did talk about them elsewhere, I'm just reiterating them here because of how much I really freaking love them. And yes, by the way, I know I'm wearing a Christmas hat after Christmas, but Jesse loves Christmas and I only get to wear this hat one time of year. So indulge me a little bit. Just be glad that I didn't, and I even have it right here. Just be glad I didn't wear my freaking over, over the top uh, Christmas sweater dress, which I kind of almost did, but I'm like, no, no, Jesse, calm down. It's too much. It's too much. But regardless, so as I said before, this video is just going to be mostly things that I haven't talked about elsewhere and things that came out uh, or got a lot of notice in 2021. But I'm also going to cheat a little bit here and there and mention things that I have talked about a little bit elsewhere just because I love them so much and want you to see that. And also, I'm going to talk about things that I discovered personally this year, even if they've been out for years or in this case is decades uh, in some of the cases. And finally, also, I'm going to wrap out the video talking about some personal stuff that really meant a lot to me this year. And I just wanted to share with all of you how much uh, certain things meant to me on a very personal level, um, specifically around this channel, and a bunch of other stuff. We'll talk about that towards the end. Forgotten City. Okay, this game was absolutely amazing. For those of you who don't know, Forgotten City is an indie video game that started off as a Skyrim mod, but eventually became its own game this year and easily, easily was one of the coolest, smartest, and most unique experiences I've ever had in a video game. The basic idea is that you get sent back in time and trapped in a time loop within an underground city where there is only one rule. If anyone commits a sin in that city, Every single person will be killed and turned into a golden statue. But because you're from the future, you know that someone is going to break the rule soon. And it's your job to try and figure out who and why that's going to happen. Now, this on its face is a really cool idea. And the city is filled with supremely interesting characters and quests and some of the most intriguing and dark and thoughtful uh, quests I've ever seen. But what's really interesting about this game is that it's honestly basically just a philosophical discussion in story and video game form. Because it asks questions of what does it mean to commit a sin? Whose morality defines what a sin is? Some characters in the game do truly horrific stuff, like a merchant selling life-saving medicine for a ridiculous price, or a man tricking another man into slavery, as well as the rampant classism within this city, as you see, even with just the small amount of people that are in it. But none of that is considered a sin in this world because no one gets turned to statues. And so it's sort of an interesting dive into what that means. And on top of that, there's some really intriguing um, exploration and building out of this world. I don't want to spoil too much, but some of the things you discover about Forgotten City and what it says about cultural appropriation, about how we steal things from other cultures and build upon other cultures, is fascinating. And also this game just has a really kind of creepy vibe at times that you just constantly feel unsettled in ways that you don't expect. And the ending of this game, by the way, too, is also a huge, huge swing that I 100% won't spoil, but they really went for it. They really went for it in the end. And uh, it could have, it could have whiffed, but I think it was a home run and was fantastic. That ending is probably one of the most satisfying endings I've gotten in a video game ever. Um, and I, I want to do a whole video on this game. I probably will at some point. But if you have not played Forgotten City, go out and play it right now because it is freaking fantastic. Psychonauts 2. 
So I played this game a little bit on stream this year. So if you caught me playing the stream, you probably know how much I love this game. Psychonauts 2 is the long awaited sequel to Tim Schafer's original Psychonauts from over 10 years ago, uh, which was a game that I also played this year and really, really loved, even though it has not aged perfectly. I mean, there's a whole thing about an Indian burial ground in that game that is not great, but overall still a really good game. But Psychonauts 2 just wormed its way into my brain. I love collectathon games. I mean, Banjo Tooie and Super Mario 64 are just two of my favorite games of all time. They would probably make my top 10 if I sat down and made one. And Psychonauts 2 just perfectly scratched that itch in a way that this genre hasn't in years. But beyond just the collectathon stuff that just engages my uh, my my brain in that particular uh, dopamine fulfilling way, the game is also incredibly, incredibly funny. The story is heartbreaking at times too. And dear Lord, the level design is so smart and clever. And each world that you enter into is basically kind of based upon you jumping into people's brains. And they each so cleverly mirror gameplay with showcasing issues of mental health. Like with one level being a British Bake Off sort of thing, mirroring performance anxiety. It's just so damn clever. It's so damn clever, and I so rarely see games like this actually mirror the gameplay with what the story is trying to say, and I really, really love that. Oh, and also, this is a subtle thing, but this game is one of the few things in all of media, honestly, that I think got consent, the idea of consent, so perfectly. Rasputin, the king character of the game, always asks someone for permission to enter their mind. And there's also another scene where another character doesn't allow his partner to kiss him, while he is in another person's body because it wasn't his body. You see Wonder Woman 1984? It's not that freaking hard to get that right. So I just also want to give kudos to Psychonauts 2 for like actually depicting consent well in ways that you rarely see in media. Life is Strange True Colors. This game broke my heart in the absolute best way. If some of you watched me streaming this game, you saw that several times while playing it, I just kind of broke down crying. This game is such a beautiful exploration of generational trauma, about finding your place, uh, the dangers of empathy, and also within all of that, just beautifully evoking small town culture and small town community in both the beautiful aspects of that and the harsher aspects of that. This game so captured the welcomingness of a small community and also some of the subtle racism that can be inherent in these towns, as well as the ostracization and pushing out of certain people within communities that can happen as well. And I think it just nailed it so perfectly. Also, this game has a bisexual and Asian protagonist, which is awesome to see. Uh, speaking from the bisexual side, I thought they nailed that so freaking wonderfully. Um, and I can't speak for the Asian side of things, but I, from what I saw, I thought it evoked that really, really well as well. And also just elements of this game story where like there's the entire town doing a LARP to help cheer up a grieving kid is just so beautifully clever and heartwarming. Also, the soundtrack is amazing this. Also, this game is like based as all hell too. The story of the game is so incredibly anti-corporation and shows how like corporations get entrenched in small communities and sort of stick themselves up as like a pillar of the community, but how they're not really there for the community, they're there for themselves and profit. And I don't wanna spoil too much about that because that kind of is part of the, the mystery and the story of the game, but it, it does that. And then it also there's a whole section about how policing is all often there to reinforce the power of corporations and big money rather than actually protecting citizens and it's not done in a way that like beats you over the head with it but it's certainly there and it's just this game is one of the most I think subtly political games uh that I've seen this year most definitely and I think that that was fantastic to see at the end of the day I just really adore the Life is Strange series and True Colors just proved to me why and I think that this might be the best game in the entire series while I love other Life is Strange games, they can be a little bit stilted. This game, just the writing felt so natural and on point that I really just loved it. And like all good Life is Strange games, it's just emotionally resonant and has a universal story, which also tells something so unique and individual at the same time. But it proves within that how we can all relate to each other's humanity and how the specific, how the individual, in fact, becomes the universal and actually shows that our differences are the things that bring us together. And this game, I think, is just an evocation of everything I love in some of my favorite stories. And I think you should all go play it. Outer Wilds Echoes of the Eye. So I've already done a whole video on Outer Wilds and why I loved it, so go check out that video. But Outer Wilds, for those of you who don't know, is a time loop game where you're tasked with discovering why your solar system is dying in 20 minutes. And every 20 minutes, the world resets. And this DLC, Echoes of the Eye, adds a whole new planet to explore, but with an insanely clever twist as well as an extra horror element, which I absolutely adored. At its core, Outer Wilds is a game about exploration, about death, 
being okay with death and coming to terms with our own death and how we still resonate and our lives are still important even beyond death through community, through generations. Um, and our lives should just be about finding things, exploring things, finding connection with each other and to the universe. It's a game that can only ever truly be played once and never really fully re-experienced the same way because it is about discovery. And once you discover it, that's it. And so the original Outer Wilds was so meaningful to me and yet I can never replay it. I mean, you can't see it, but that poster up there is, is Outer Wilds up there on the wall, this little black edge you see in the frame here. But I was so glad that they made this DLC because it allowed me to return to this story one more time. And it's so special. I don't want to say too much because it would ruin the exploration of this world for you. I say just go in. If you haven't played Outer Wilds, play it and know that this Echoes of the Eye DLC adds on top of it, changes things a little bit, has a beautiful, so amazing world to discover and enjoy, but I don't want to say a word about it other than to say you should play it. Outer Wilds is a once in a lifetime game and this DLC just exemplifies why. Star Trek Coda. So I've done full reviews of this on my other channel of this climactic book trilogy, so go check those out. They'll probably be linked down below. But for those of you who don't know, I am a huge fan of Star Trek books. I think that they are some of the best places for Star Trek stories. And after Star Trek Nemesis and Enterprise went off the air in the early 2000s, effectively stopping any new Star Trek for a long time, the torch of the story of the Star Trek universe for well over a decade was basically handed off to the Star Trek novels, with excellent authors of the time media continuing each Star Trek series in totally fresh and unique ways. They introduced new elements to the post Star Trek Nemesis timeline, similar to how Star Wars did much the same with its expanded universe before Disney erased it all for the sequel trilogy with things like Thrawn and stuff like that. And in many ways for me, this literary universe that grew out post Nemesis was my Star Trek. I grew up during that weird period where there was little to new Star Trek on screen to be had. And so the only new releases that I had, the version of the universe that I fell in love with was these books. And I swear I will advocate for the post Star Trek Nemesis books as basically the best Star Trek there is. But sadly with new Star Trek shows like Picard coming out, that literary universe couldn't stick around in the same way that the sequel trilogy sort of erased that EU for Star Wars. But what I really appreciate is that the authors of the Coda trilogy is the authors of these tie-in media saying that they don't want this universe to go out with a whimper like the Star Wars EU did, but with a huge bang. And the Coda trilogy ties up a decade of storytelling in a truly no-holds-barred finale for the Trek universe filled with amazing crossovers, surprises, heartbreaking deaths, and some awesome moments, and I, I absolutely loved it. This feels like the culmination of that entire literary universe. And in many ways, the Star Trek universe pre-Star Trek Discovery. And don't get me wrong, I love Star Trek Discovery, Picard, Lower Decks, all those things. But this felt like a true finale to that era of Trek. It was very bittersweet for me, and I'm sad to see it go. But the ending with this trilogy made it all feel worthwhile and weighty in a way that few time media properties ever get the chance to be. And I thank them for it. Star Trek Lower Decks. Speaking of modern Star Trek, I've already done way too many videos about my love of Lower Decks this year, so I'll just point you to those two videos, but dear God do I love the show, and I'm just going to use another excuse to just say how much I loved it. But I will also say here that this year I got to interview the creator of Star Trek Lower Decks, Mike McMahon, uh, with my friend Aaron Harvey, and I got to share with McMahon how much this show means to me as a Trekkie. Getting to talk to him was a highlight of my professional career, and me getting to do that was all thanks to this community on this channel, and I want to tell you all how much that means to me, that I got to experience that moment with a creator of a show that means so much to me as well. So thank you to all of you. And also I should say, while Lower Decks is my favorite Star Trek on right now, I like all modern Star Trek going on right now, and especially Star Trek Prodigy and Discovery this year were both excellent. And I especially adore that Star Trek Discovery is delving into more politically themed topics this season on season four, as well as my love of all of Star Trek, just embracing the transgender community, which for me is so incredibly important. I've said this before, but it means so much that my favorite franchise, the franchise that informed my morality, informed my sense of self, gave me an identity, uh, just is so much to me that it is standing by that idea of IDIC, um, infinite diversity and infinite combinations, that's why I have it tattooed on my, my hand, and doing so in a way that speaks to a community and to myself in a way that I never thought this franchise would. Uh, and it shows to me that I gave my heart to the right franchise and proves to me that Star Trek, for all of its faults, and it does have many, even in the modern incarnations, it has many as well, um, its own unique ones, 
but it always embodies the values that I have tried to live my life by and tattooed on my arms. Discworld. So for some weird reason, I never got into Terry Pratchett until this year and dear God, I did not know what I was missing. His Discworld books are some of the most absolutely hysterical and yet deeply insightful satire of not only fantasy, but with, you know, systems of bureaucracy and society and marginalization and the rules that we live by today in a modern society that feels so weird and made up. And he just, Pratchett just so gets at that. And I, I absolutely love, I love it in a, in a fantasy type of way, but it feels so directly targeted and still fresh. I mean, Pratchett was breaking down gender norms and government bureaucracy in the Discworld series before it was cool. And he also seems like he was just also a supremely kind soul of a person. Knowing that it kind of makes me laugh that TERFs this year tried to claim him earlier this year and say, oh, he would have said this about gender. When, if you read any of his books, you can tell that that was not the case. And he was very much affirming of the trans community. He was very clever and insightful and certainly had his faults. There's definitely fat phobia in the series that I've even seen in the few books that I've read so far, but you can tell that his books just stand for everything that um, TERFs oppose. And I, I, it just makes me feel so warm and fuzzy inside. And I, I adore these books and I'm so excited to get into more of them because there's kindness in them. There's laughing in the face of hatred and bigotry and a recognizing that everything is made up and the points don't matter. And all that matters is caring about each other and laughing along the way. And I can't wait to dive into more of these books. For all mankind, this is another show that I've already done videos on that I recommend you check out, but this is also a show I don't think that enough people are talking about. So I'm bringing it up here because if you are not watching For All Mankind, you are missing out on probably one of the best science fiction shows that is ongoing today. For All Mankind is so fantastic. To quick sell you on the pitch of the show, it's an Apple Plus TV show that is an alternate history universe about a world where Russia got to the moon before the United States and therefore caused a reinvigoration of the United States space program instead of it dying off like it did in our real world. And it is one of the most thoughtful, inspiring, and moving shows that I have ever watched. This show, as Battlestar Galactica showrunner, writer Ronald D. Moore states, is a series all about how something like space and focusing on human progress and science can truly bring humanity together beyond both personal barriers and more importantly, beyond political barriers as well, with this show being very much about breaking down of the Cold War in a way that feels more positive and constructive than it did in our real world. But it's also a show filled with intrigue, drama, and some of the best acting you will ever see. But even more importantly, I think the thing that really resonates with me about the show is it's basically a prequel to how we get to a Star Trek future. It's a series about a humanity filled with flaws that is still managing to do great things, to believe in the best of ourselves, and evolve and yet still is very much embroiled in all the flaws that humanity is embroiled in today, and yet trying, trying to do better. And I adored it so much. It really just felt like that Star Trek prequel that I've always wanted. Loki. Okay, so this series just connected with me, mostly because of how much I freaking love Tom Hiddleston. He's just so much fun every single time he's on screen. And also this shows themes of identity, overcoming how people view us, of overcoming this idea that we have a predetermined destiny, which has a subtly politically subversive idea in it as well. Like there's this sort of idea from politics, like there's this is the way that all things have to be. This is the way that you have to go down because of this is who you are. This is the path that you have to follow. And this show is all about like saying, nah, we can reclaim our narratives. We don't have to be seen as the villains of our story in society, which feels very resonant to many marginalized people and it also speaks so well to the character of Loki it fits him so perfectly if you know anything about his character not only in the comics but in Norse mythology I really love that and also I just identify so much with that gender fluid as guardian god who constantly feels vilified uh I, I love that I love it also this show has just a timey-wimey story and has an awesome final episode that speaks to so many cool things coming up in the MCU uh going forward and also Richard E. Grant is amazing in this show uh also Lady Loki is fantastic I think she was wonderful and yes this show does have the problematic issues that Disney and MCU properties typically always have, such as the militarized police force that is the Time Bureau without really the show analyzing what that means that they're a police force or also the teasing of but lack of true follow through on LGBTQ representation like with again Loki being hinted to be gender fluid but and um, him mentioning that he's bisexual but not really showing that in any real substantive way. So that definitely is a problem. It's definitely still here but with all that being said and acknowledging that, this is still one of my favorite Marvel productions ever made. 
Uh, I really love Loki. And I also, as I said before, did a whole video inspired by this one. I put on a lot of sexy costumes into it. It's one of the videos I'm most proud of this year. Um, so please go check out that one if you haven't. Good girls. Okay, so I'm not really the person to talk about music all that much. When it comes to analyzing music, I'm just someone who says, that sounds good. I like that. But that being said, I will just say that the Traverch's song, Good Girls, that came out this year is fucking amazing. I can't play any of it without getting a copyright claim on this video, um, but I will just say, just listen to these lyrics. They tell me I'm hellbent on revenge. I cut my teeth on weaker men. I won't apologize again. And I've never had a taste for liars or the uniquely uninspired because I don't need to be desired. Those lyrics are fucking bomb. This song is just absolutely amazing. I, I love it. You know, that, that idea, that phrase of the uniquely uninspired um, speaks to me because I am done with people who are uniquely uninspired uh, in this world. I love working and fighting with this community and all of you and with others around the world and with other people to build a world that is inspired, that is about building community, about coming together and hope and belief in our best selves. And this song just captured that sense of resistance and being like, hell yes, we're gonna tear down these things that are imperfect and, and we're just gonna fight for a world that is better. And also it, it has like a uniquely like affirming feminine message in it as well. Um, and I think that this song is just fan freaking tastic. Also, I just kind of rock out to it all the freaking time. Like I just like dance down the street a little bit and like, oh yeah, I, I'd say I, I'm weird like that, but there you go. It, it's just a good song. Invincible. This is a series I already did a whole video on, so I'm gonna keep this really, really short so this video doesn't go long. But this series was absolutely great. It was a wonderful deconstruction of the comic book genre in a really cool way with some great animation, some truly shocking moments, great voice acting, heartbreaking stuff, and some really great and cool ideas. And I'm really excited for season two. Squid Games. So I'll keep this one short because I think we all saw Squid Games that this show just became ubiquitous for a moment there. But I will say that it absolutely deserves that attention. Squid Games is tense, insightful, brilliantly acted, and is both one of the most damning, thoughtful, stylistic indictments of capitalism that I've ever seen, while simultaneously being one of the most down-to-earth, realistic, and human stories put to screen. It is so good. And the only thing that's better than watching Squid Games is watching all the like capitalists and like far right wing folks try their damnedest to say, but it's, but it's about socialism. You see, the Squid Games is socialism and communism. <laughs> it's like, come on, there's a giant glowing piggy bank in the sky. This show is about capitalism. It's either some hilarious cognitive dissonance or outright lying or probably most likely a little bit of both, but either way I find it kind of funny. But isn't that kind of all right-wing like media, honestly? What are you gonna do? It's kind of sad, but there you go. It's like some media personalities wouldn't know how to interpret a visual metaphor if it was spelt out to them by a giant glowing piggy bank. Again, this is a show that probably deserves a whole look at it specifically, but I will just say specifically like the second episode of the show where everyone votes to go back home and then they have to return to the game uh, because of their lives they owe so much debt, they owe so much money, they need that money. It just speaks to how like we're all forced to be slaves to capitalism even if we don't want to. And I thought it was one of the most insightful ideas that I've seen a, a series about systems like that really hone in on. Um, and I, I, I did not think that I could see something clever done with a Hunger Games type formula, which itself was like a kind of anti-capitalist series as well in a less like directly uh, thoughtful way. I still enjoy the Hunger Games, at least the first two movies, but regardless, this show took that same idea and just expanded it out in brilliant ways. Pose. This is another show that deserves its own whole video for me at some point. Um, and I'll probably get to it, but Pose, a show about ballroom culture in the 1980s New York City, had its third and final season this year, and it was absolutely brilliant. I don't know how they did it, but Pose managed to be this unflinching look at the horrors faced by the LGBTQ community during the HIV epidemic, specifically in 1980s New York City. But even within that, this show did not fall into the same trap that so many other TV shows and movies about that period in LGBTQ history get trapped into with defining itself by pain and trauma because this series also just captured the sense of community, triumph, positivity, and hope that defined the queer community, not even then, but still to this day, and is what binds us all together more than our sexuality or our gender identities. And it, this show talked about the marginalization and pain that we suffer as a group, but also just allowed it to be more than that. But on top of that, 
I don't want to fully be able to claim this show as a trans queer person because this show is also very much about trans characters of color. This show just had so many trans people of color that it enabled the series to show that trans people, even within certain communities within the trans community, are not all the same. That we don't all agree. And yet, within that, we can all still reach out and care for each other. Um, and also just showed a very underrepresented group of uh, people, even within the trans community, that I think need to get even more attention. And this show will definitely be sorely missed because of that, because I feel like with this show going off the air, it has removed almost half uh, or close to half of the mainstream trans people of color representation. And that is devastating, but it speaks to how radical and amazing this show was. Also, one of my favorite storylines of this season was the LGBTQ wedding and the like terror of trans people like just going to get a wedding license and the terror of being recognized as your, uh, you know, assigned gender at birth. And then still having like this triumphant kind of stereotypical finale wedding moment, but for a trans person is something that still feels subversive. I think the only other show that's ever done that is Sense8, uh, and Pose just, I think, did it brilliantly while also acknowledging the, the terror that can come with doing that sort of thing and the, you know, the conflicts can come even within a community within that sort of thing and how much a wedding like that means to the queer community to see that. And that's not just for those people, but it's for all of us sometimes in those instances and how it brings people together. That was such a wonderfully insightful ending for this show. And I truly, truly loved Pose so much. Ted Lasso. <sighs> Ted Lasso, Ted Lasso, Ted Lasso, Ted Lasso is kind of a unique beast of a show and truly, especially in its first season, was a breath of fresh air. I'm not a sports ball person at all, but I just adored Lasso's first season because it just had this unbridled optimism and earnest sense of positivity with Jason Sudeikis' titular character just constantly pushing others around him to be better. And also, this show just had all the attractive freaking men and women that made this little bisexual's heart just die inside every time I had to watch the show because I'm like, they're too attractive, goddammit. I can't. I can't with this show. Also, if you haven't picked up on the running theme yet, I tend to like shows that showcase an optimistic view of humanity filled with diverse, attractive people. It's almost like I'm a fucking bisexual Trekkie or something. Also, my definition of attractive doesn't mean conventionally attractive, so I just want to make sure that's clear. Anyways, though, while the first season of Lasso was incredibly heartwarming and it got a lot of attention in a mid-pandemic world that was aching for that positivity, Season two changed it up. Season two could have just been more of the same, but instead though, it decided to do something that I so respect and was definitely risky because it completely deconstructed what everyone loved about the show in the first place and instead chose to dig deep and challenge its characters in ways that made them struggle with their positive outlook on the world. Ultimately, the show did so as a way of reinforcing that outlook, but it was trying to show that that struggle is a necessary part of maintaining that positivity, that it's not just inherent. For example, Ted's struggles with mental health and his wariness of therapy is a perfect example of this and something that I think is necessary for a post-pandemic world where we are all struggling with our mental health. And I really like that the show showcased that without directly being about the pandemic. It spoke to something that we needed to see right now, but didn't do it in a way that felt like it was so directly beating you on the head with it. And I thought that that was wonderful. Also on top of that, this season took a really wonderful look at masculinity that I do plan on doing an entire video on. I'm already kind of writing it out and beating it out. Eh, there's probably a better way to phrase that, but we'll forget it. But anyways, Ted Lasso talked about how masculinity can be harmful and toxic to those around uh, some folks who express that version of toxic masculinity. But also it didn't stop there because I feel like if you just end saying toxic masculinity is bad, it kind of leaves people out in the cold. But this show also presented a positive masculinity as well, one that was still built on toughness and strength, but also upon empathy, compassion, protection, and understanding, teaching, and more. I mean, fucking Roy Kent is the best example of positive masculinity I've ever seen since Captain freaking Pike on Star Trek Discovery, and dear God, there is nothing sexier. But regardless, again, I'm gonna do a whole video on that masculinity idea because I think that that is just such, such a cool thing that this show did and deserves to be analyzed. Arcane in Castlevania. Okay, so I'm lumping these two shows together just because I did individual videos on both of them, but both of these shows, and especially Arcane, especially Arcane, are truly 
fantastic and some of the best shows I've ever seen, made even more shocking by the fact that they're both video game adaptations. While I have some quibbles with how Castlevania ended, I also love that it allowed its characters to be morally gray on all fronts without overtly vilifying any of them, even the vampires, and showcasing the complexities of trauma, pain, and uh, seeking to fight back against oppression and seeking of revenge against people and how that can lead to cycles of just constantly harming and hurting others on both a personal level and a political level. And it also didn't simply fall prey into that violence versus nonviolence dichotomy that most of our media falls into when talking about these topics. And I really, really love that. Plus also the like aesthetic of Castlevania is very much my aesthetic. I love like gothic horror -y type of stuff. Uh, and that was really cool to see. But similarly, Arcane took that same idea of not just falling into this like violence versus nonviolent tact when discussing uh, people pushing back against oppression, but it took that theme and multiplied it by 10. I don't think I've ever seen a series that had this much mainstream attention be so incredibly nuanced as Arcane is, with its exploring the intricacies of how class, marginalization, and resistance all work, and how there is no completely black or white way to look at all that stuff, that it's all just unfortunately messy because of the entire situation, but that how people fighting for uh, resisting against oppression and being pushed into the lower class and being ignored and constantly beat down and constantly shoved to the side and looked down upon and vilified as a community um, gets to people and people rightfully willing to fight back for that and how messy that can get. I mean, my favorite character in the show was Silco, ostensibly the main antagonist of the series who is not a good man by any means, yet is still humanized. And in many ways, he's proven right that sometimes violence and a hard stance against a ruling class is sometimes the only way you'll get listened to, even if he does relish it a bit more than he probably should. I'm not advocating for violence necessarily on this channel, just making sure that's clear, but this show just really looked at all of that and how... Again, I've said it already, but messy that is. Not only that though, but all the other characters on the show are also thoughtful. Um, even like the upper class characters are also shown to be complex human beings that aren't just like vilified, even though they are extenuating oppression and using police oppression at times in the series. And as such allows us to explore intersections of privilege, mental health, education, and systems of oppression. And even further, Arcane is just so stylistically amazing, and I don't ever think I've seen a show match visual flair, musical choice, cinematography, and writing to just masterfully showcase all of these themes. Also, this show literally pulled my heart out and stomped on it numerous times in a way that I really loved, and I cannot wait for this show to do it again in season two. Hippo and the Age of the Wonder Beasts. Okay, so technically this show ended in 2020, but I just discovered it this year, and uh, I loved it. I loved Kipo and the Wonder Beast. It's such a great series that is beautifully animated, hilarious, clever. The music choice, like Arcane, is fantastic as well. This show follows Kipo, a young girl who's thrown into a post-apocalyptic world where animals have become sentient, but are also still separated by species. And the show chronicles her journey to unite this world with a sense of community and solidarity, all while being sometimes beautifully, naively optimistic. Honestly, just give me a naive, optimistic protagonist who eventually brings people together in community and toss in some visual flair and awesome music choices, and yeah, you've made a Jesse Gender show. That's that's all I need. That's all I need, really. Also, I should say, Kipo Season 1 has one of the best coming out scenes for a gay character I think I've ever seen. And it's not even like a coming out scene, but it's the scene where you learn that a character is gay. I thought it was brilliantly done uh, and unique, and I've never seen a show do it that way before, and I think that that was really, really cool. The Matrix Resurrections. Okay, being honest, I have not seen this movie yet. It's coming out in a few weeks as of the time of me recording this video, so I, I'm just assuming that I'm really gonna love it, but knowing how much I love all of the other Matrix movies, all of the other Matrix movies, and how like subversive and political and thoughtful they are and how dense their metaphors are, they talk about um, anti-capitalism, uh, there's trans metaphors in there, philosophy and ideas of identity um, and oppression and all this stuff. They're just so dense, even to this day, and speak so much to today um, that the original Matrix, like you go back and watch the original Matrix and you understand that it was foretelling things that we are talking about today. It's all there. And I'm really uh, excited that I think this movie will probably continue that and really push forward the genre. And hey, it may end up being bad. You probably already all know if it's bad or not by the time you see this video. So it may end up being bad, but knowing the Wachowskis, even their bad movies are interesting. And I know only one of the Wachowskis is working on this film, but even their bad movies are interesting. And so I'm just very excited to see Resurrections. The Expanse. 
So The Expanse's final season, season six, is still ongoing on Amazon Prime right now. But for my discussion in this video, I'm talking about both season six, the ending of season five that was still in 2021, as well as the final book in the series that came out, Leviathan Falls, that I'm still in the middle of reading, but already know is really, truly something special. The Expanse is the best space opera that you will ever watch and some of the best hard science fiction that you will see. This show is not optimistic. Uh, it's one of those few science fiction shows that's a little bit more dystopian than typically I think are my favorite types of shows. But this show just so understands the different politics of different things of like how fascism works with the Martians and how they build up on senses of nationalism and industry. Uh, you have senses of like critiques on socialism as well. You have, uh, you know, criticisms and looking at anarchy within the, the Belters as well and, and how those people fight back as well against the oppression and the decentralization that they face their entire lives. And also just does space well and actually like makes you feel the danger of being in space in such a fantastic way. Also has cool Lovecraftian horror stuff that you don't really see as much in science fiction type of stories. I think the last big one was like Mass Effect that had those like big Lovecraftian elements done as well as this show. The acting though is phenomenal. Like Amos, Amos, my boy Amos. Oh, I love him so much he's so good west chatham is fantastic he is so good as amos and so different from his real life personality if you listen to uh the podcast that he does with ty the one of the writers of the book also i have not like i said i haven't finished the book yet but from what I'm reading, this feels like a satisfying conclusion to this epic series. I've read all of the books so far, and uh, it's so rare that a series like this ends satisfyingly, and I'm very close to the end here, so I can't speak definitively on this, but from everything I've heard and everything I'm reading right now, this feels like such a great, satisfying conclusion. Um, and this show is so smart, so smart. The thing that I really love about this show, and that speaks to me, is that if Star Trek is a series about humanity overcoming its limitations in order to do something great. The Expanse is about a series where humanity, in spite of its limitations, does something great because all these humans on this series are flawed as hell. The systems that humans built are flawed as hell. And yet there are moments, moments, where we become something greater in The Expanse. And I think that that's really cool to see. And I think it, it just nails that. Like humans, despite our flaws, can do great. If Star Trek says we move beyond them, this show says we won't move beyond them but we can still do better. And I love that for The Expanse. Summit of the Gods. So this is a last minute inclusion on this list that I actually didn't write on the script, but I literally watched just last night. And this movie was haunting. This is a anime film about the mindset of mountaineers, of climbers. If any of you watched the documentary Free Solo that came out a few years ago, which was probably one of my favorite documentaries ever, that was a movie that dove into the mindset of why people go climbing in ways that endangers their lives. What what caused them to put their lives on the line so needlessly and risk their lives so needlessly just to climb a mountain and just to do something harder, to reach this higher feat, to just add this challenge to themselves. And this movie, Summit of the Gods, delves into that mindset about why people do this and I think truly captures it in a hauntingly, hauntingly beautiful way. There are images in this film that are beautiful and you just see like moments where characters stare up at the sky and see the night sky in a way that I think none of us ever will unless we're up on the mountain at that height. But also the risk that people take and the, the, the horrors that can happen on these sort of challenges that people do. There are some action beats in the movie that just had me riveted and so intensely scared, especially to know that like stuff like that's happened. and. It's tragic where people fall off of mountains and get trapped and how they try to save themselves but ultimately sometimes can't. Um, and you just feel the terror of that. And I literally was, I don't get squeamish during movies and this is not like a gory movie in it at all. But you just moments where you're just like, oh my God, I can't, I can't. Oh, it's so, it's so horrifying. And it's real, even though this is anime. And it just captures that. And it captures that mentality. And one of the final sequences of this movie, you understand finally why people do this and you're haunted by it. And there's one image at the end of this film that will stick with me for a long time. And I don't wanna spoil it. I will just say, go watch this movie. It is such a great dive into the mindset of why people do something like this. And I, I really think it's one of the best films that I've seen. This community. So to wrap up this video, if you hadn't caught this running theme, uh, that goes throughout not only this video and the things that I like, but pretty much all of my work. Community and finding 
a sense of coming together in infinite diversity and infinite combinations means a lot to me. And I want to end this video on something personal with respect to that. For me, this year has easily been the most fulfilling creative and professional years of my life. Despite the world being what it is in 2021, I managed to create some work this year that I'm truly, truly proud of. My videos like The Nature of Work, my Loki video, or my Sex and Star Trek video that came out a couple weeks ago, as well as personal videos like the one that I did about the death of my grandmother, which I still think is one of the most personal things that I've ever done, um, as well as my video on Earthsea, which is also a very personal video for me. All those videos that I mentioned were videos that I made this year. I think are some of the best things I've ever made. And I'm honestly shocked when I watch them because I'm not entirely sure who made them because they seem too good to have been made by me. I'm insanely proud of that as well as my collaborators, like my best friend Lucian, who was editing this video, by the way. Um, I never thought that I would be able to make things like that. To actually make something that feels good and feels like it resonates not only with myself, but if what other people tell me in the comments and messages resonates with other people. That is an absolute honor. And on top of that, more importantly to me, I got to meet and connect with people that I really look up to and I'm shocked uh, that I even deigned to talk to me. I mean, I got to interview Mike McMahon this year, the guy who literally runs my current favorite show in my favorite franchise of all, of all time. And he knows my channel. That blew my mind. It blew my mind. And I also got to reach out and, and get to know other wonderful creators in the YouTube space and, and people that I've respected for so long and look up to. Um, I, I can't mention them all and I'm not going to name names specifically just because I feel like I would definitely leave people out that I'm just surprised that I'm even in the same sphere as um, and people uh, that are just absolutely wonderful and making it really brilliant work and to be considered, maybe this is thinking too high myself, but just a peer of any of them. I'm humbled by it. I'm humbled by the fact that even people would even know my name. And so that's absolutely wonderful. But more important than those people that I got to meet, the people that I got to meet that mean the most to me are all of you. Because none of this, none of this would have been possible without this community on this channel. I know I say this often, but I say it because it never ceases to be true. I am so honored by this community that has been created around this channel. The people who show up in my comments, watch my videos, hang out on my live streams, respond to me on Twitter, um, support me on Patreon. I'm humbled by you. I am humbled by your kindness and your thoughtfulness. And not only that, I've joked about me loving community this whole video, as I said before, but it makes me so happy to see community, not only in my fiction, but here too. The fact that on my live streams, I see folks always being welcoming and saying hi to new folks coming into the live stream, caring for others, um, making sure to affirm other people and answer questions and, and all that stuff. It warms my heart. It warms my heart and it means so much to me. And I am glad to be just a small part of that because all of you make that, not me. I just enable it. I just create the uh, YouTube videos that I'm just, I'm just a weird dork in the internet making YouTube videos. And it's all of you that make this something special, not me. I wouldn't have been able to do any of the things that I've done. I wouldn't be able to make those dorky YouTube videos or make the work that I've made or be proud of the things that I've done or meet the cool people that I've done or just be happy because I am happy. I wouldn't be able to do that with all of you. And a special thanks on top of that to my patrons who do all of this, everything that I've said, and create that wonderful community over here and over on Patreon and in my Discord server as well. But more importantly, allow me to keep doing this and to eat. Because um, I do like eating. Eating is nice. Paying bills is nice. So especially to all of you um, patrons, thank you. Thank you, you beautiful people. I could not do this without your support. Truly. You've all, all of you, patrons or not, you've made this past year of my life special in a world where it sometimes feels hard to find something that special. But I do think that special sense of community is a lot more common than I think a lot of us realize because I think humans do like to find that community, do like to find that beauty, do like to find that sense of connection. Why do you think there's so many TV shows that I love and adore that talk about that? Because it is something we all yearn for. And I'm just glad to be a part of one. And to that end, I hope to continue to do this into 2022. I have work that I'm really excited about coming in the near future. Some videos I've already written, um, some videos coming up, both here and elsewhere. Uh, some stuff I have planned that I don't want to talk about and not spoil, but I'm very excited about. But for the first time in my life, I feel that my best work is ahead of me. Not only the stuff that I'm currently working and planning on, but 
I have the sense of confidence in myself and a confidence to think that maybe I'll get the chance to keep pursuing my creativity, not only for myself, but in hopes of helping to build, even if only in my small way, add maybe a stone to that positive Star trek future that so inspires me. If I and the community that I'm a part of just gets to help do a little bit to help make that future, I will feel like I've lived a life worth living. And I feel like that's part of the journey that my life is getting to go on now. And I am honored and humbled by it. And I'm glad that we get to do it together. And so with that said, I'll see you all in 2022 where I'm going to be turning 29, not 30. Uh, and I thank you again for everything, everything that you have given me. I wish you for the last time in this year to live long and prosper. So since both of my videos in December are going to be overly long and indulgent, I'm going to be overly long and indulgent in my Patreon thank you this month as well. I just want to say that 2021 was the most professionally fulfilling year of my life that I have ever had. I've gotten to do things that I never thought I would get to do, meet people that I never got to meet, people that I look up to and uh, are, are heroes to me that I got to actually talk to. I got to find a sense of confidence in my voice and my creativity that I never thought I would have. But most importantly, the thing that I cherish most out of all of that, and the only reason I was able to do all of that was because of the community that this channel has formed. And I am so proud and thankful for it. And most specifically within all of that, my Patreon supporters, all of you, whether you supported me just this month or you were only supported me for one month this year or any time like that, I just want to say to you, thank you. I would have nothing close to what I have today without all of you. And I cannot tell you how thankful I am, how meaningful it is to me, and how much I could never repay you. Not even financially. I mean, you're all paying my bills, but even more than that, on a more profound level, you have given me a life that feels fulfilling and worth pursuing. And I can never repay that. So to all of my patrons, regardless of whether your name is spoken aloud or in the credits, whether you've given a dollar, 10 cents, whatever, thank you for allowing me to do this and for being you. And with all that said, here is, of course, the final patron wrap of 2021. Morgan, the Pirate Queen, Joe Herman Holt, Miranda Janelle, Eli Berg, Moss, Catherine Lambeth, Ashley Allen, Bo Kiki, Yo, D. Ray, Steve Link, Kleinar, Jemshin, Ish the Mad, Randy Thompson, a man chooses a slave, obeys, Boy to Mary Beth, Earl, Mary Mello, Wellington Marcus, Chloe Dollar, G-Man 42, Joseph Dewey, Natalie Fortune, Felicia Toast, Alex Miller, T. Rutsa, James Krivda, Barbara Ruski, Elizabeth Christensen, Dominic Noble, Jessica Wright, Nathaniel Froughton, Sonia Naru Perdo, Peter Landers, Horangato, Wendizzle Bizzle, Celestial Dawn, Geek Filter, Pissed and Twisted Garage, W. Randy, E.D., Meadow Whisper, John with a B, Melinda Walters, Petrix Pruvis, Alex Owen, Ulysses the Pagan, Base, Casual Observer, Lysa, Maggie the Goblin, Flynn. Bah humbug, Tiffany Danger, Angie Pugh are just on, Lamia William Stewart, Gretchen Badger, Jess Johnson, Sarah Lomero, Jessica Chapman, Sari Leslie Hutchkins, Kayliss, Sarah Bystem, Sky Skinner, Laura Demero, Troy Thull, Noble Monster Comics, Nathan Steele, Jacob Tovar, Melody and Winter's Good, Heresis, Fit7, Blue, Sean Piper, Spooky Heather, Sylvia, Jason Not, Andrew K, Strawberry Pup. Tart, May Polymena, Munir Amlani, Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, Crit Facts, Chris Overbeck, Eva Caniva, The Blessed Rain, Newt has joined me, Michael Goaty, Joan One Librarian, Jen Mabel Pasty, Ver Elijah M. Philip Hawkins, Andy H. Corey and Vale, Honkanen, 
Truly, I know I said it before, but from both me and Newt, who hates being picked up, but he at least wanted to be in this video, uh, I say thank you to all of you for being lovely and amazing, and we both send you all of our love going into 2022. Mwah.